Good morning and welcome to Sunday morning worship at Forest Hills. I'm David Reed and I have the pleasure of serving as the minister to students. We'll begin worship in just a moment, but first I have a few brief announcements I'd like to share with you. Vacation Bible School. Spark Studios is now only two weeks away. From June 6th through the 10th, we'll be sparking some imagination and kicking creativity in the high year. And here's a few VBS numbers for you. We've prepared five full days of fun inside of 51 rooms directed and identified by 78 signs using 285 paintbrushes and markers. And we anticipate having over 400 kids and volunteers who will enjoy an experience designed and blessed by countless numbers of hours and prayers. On that Friday night, June the 10th, everyone is invited to our VBS Family Night where we'll host a huge celebration with free dinner, inflatables, music, games, and surprises. Visit our website to learn more, enroll a child, or sign up to volunteer today. Also in your bulletin is more information about several special events happening in the coming days and weeks, including our Summer College Community Group with free dinner and an engaging Bible study happening each Thursday night beginning this week. Sign-ups for co-ed adult sand volleyball also happening on Thursday nights this summer. Our two recently announced women's summer fellowships featuring a short devotional and a casual dinner and hosted inside the Student Center on June 23rd and July 14th for only $10. Our kids skate day for kindergarten through fifth graders full of roller skating and video games on July 1st. Registration deposits are due on July 3rd for our senior adult overnight trip to Branson, Missouri to see the great passion play, other theater shows, and more in early October. And as for our middle and high school students, summer is jam-packed with several trips and activities. Be looking for some pop-up activities each week throughout the summer, and we still have a couple of spots for Fuge Camp. So if you miss the deadline, we could still get you in. But hurry, those spots won't last long. Finally, don't forget that next Sunday, May the 29th, we'll be updating our Sunday worship schedule. We'll start the morning with one sanctuary worship service at 8.15 a.m. Then host all of our Sunday school classes at 9.30 a.m. And Elevate Worship will remain at 11 o'clock. And as you invite your friends and neighbors and others to Sunday morning worship, we encourage you to grab a handful of our brand new invitation cards located on these displays right here in the atrium and in the fellowship hall. Remember, one invite can change a life. Well, that's all I've got, and it's time for worship to begin. Now, you can find everything I've shared and even more inside today's bulletin. For those at home, it's accessible on our website and on our mobile app. Again, we're so glad that you've joined us for worship today at Forest Hills Baptist Church. Well, good morning, Forest Hills. We're so glad to be here with you worshiping together. If you would please stand, let's fix our eyes on Jesus as we sing. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire. We want to see you 
Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see it. Open up the floodgates. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jonathan and Emily, for being here this morning, and band for leading us in worship. Um, welcome to Forest Hills Baptist Church. We're glad that you're joining us here for worship this morning. I also want to give a warm welcome to those joining us online. Thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. I'm Matt Longworth, minister to young adults. I want to encourage all of you to fill out a connection card for us this morning. You can find one on the seat back in front of you, or you can scan the QR code to fill one out digitally um, during the service. It's a great way for us to get to know you a little bit, but also um, a way for you to send a prayer request so that we can be praying for you this week. If you're new to Forest Hills, I encourage you to, after the service, join us out through those doors in the Elevate Lobby um, at the Connection Center. Um, Kenneth Bonnet, our pastor of Connections, will be there and other greeters to meet you so you can get to know and learn more about the church and so we can get to know you a little bit that you're here. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to draw your attention in your bulletin if you grabbed one on your way in. There's an insert of 2021 and 2022 college Graduates, Can we take a moment and just celebrate them as they've completed this accomplishment this year? Um, these young adults have just completed um, their undergrads or their graduate degrees, and they're listed here in the bulletin. Um, I want you to take this insert, and I want, to keep, I want you to keep it with you the next few months. I want you to pray for them um, and their names as they transition to this next phase of life. Um, a lot of, there's probably a lot of familiar faces on here as well, so if you see them, be sure to congratulate them. I know a few are here in the room right now, so be sure to congratulate them as you see them um, in, the, in the weeks ahead. And um, finally, just church family, thank you for your uh, continued faithful and generous giving each week. Um, giving is an act of worship, and it helps support the weekly ministries that are happening here at Forest Hills. So you can give at the collection boxes today on your way out um, at the entrances, or give online at fhbc.org forward slash give. Let's continue in worship through prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this time of worship that we're able to gather and to lift up your name. Father, you are worthy of all of our worship, God, and I pray that as we continue our worship, you are exalted, that you're high and lifted up, Lord, that you are glorified in our time of singing and our time of hearing the word this morning. Thank you for these graduates. Thank you for a church family who prays for our college students, who prays for our young adults as they enter new seasons of life. God, I pray that these graduates specifically I feel your presence, Lord, that they lean on you for understanding, that they lean to you for guidance in the next steps of their lives. Lord, thank you for blessing them and for um, getting them through those hard years of college and grad degrees. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping together.
and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This Jesus is the one who we are fixing our eyes on this morning, the one who we are calling upon. Let's call out to him now as we sing this next song. This is gonna be a new song for a lot of us, but just jump in as soon as you catch on. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that I can't there's not a mountain that he can remove. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word.
let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we look to you. We thank you that you are the one who is holding the universe together by the word of your power. Please open our eyes and our ears and our hearts this morning as we open your word. Lord, grow our faith this morning as we look to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. So good to see all of you. So good to welcome you to Forest Hills as we continue our journey through the book of Acts. If you've got a copy of God's Word with you, I want to get you to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 12. We're going to walk through uh, the whole chapter, 25 verses. We're going to walk through it, but it all fits together in uh, what is really a cool story that really follows kind of the same plot line, the same type of storyline that we're all used to in all of our favorite shows, movies, books, uh, what have you, right? There's something to all of those movies, all of those books that keeps us coming back. There's something that grabs a hold of us, grabs our attention, and, uh, and, and means that we sit through, you know, for two or three hours after we paid 50 bucks to watch a movie, you know, in the theater, or while we watch the TV show, and if we're watching on Netflix, we binge watch and get right into, you know, the next uh, episode and the next season and go through and watch the whole thing, because there's a storyline that grabs onto us early part of a story we're introduced to the characters we get to know kind of who's who and what their story is and to some extent what they are experiencing in the beginning is good things are going well things are right things are happy moving in the right direction but then something happens attention is introduced or exposed a crisis takes place uh, maybe even a villain that wants to disrupt that harmony and that beauty and that goodness that was experienced at the beginning something happens that causes things to break, causes things to fracture. Now things are not what they were. Uh, they're not as good as they were. Something has gone wrong. And in the midst of that, perhaps that villain kind of emerges or at least the bad guys kind of emerge. And for the better part of the middle of the movie or the book or the TV show, okay, the bad guys appear to be winning. That they appear to have the upper hand and there's all this question about what's going to happen and how's good going to prevail and who's going to save the day and you know what's going to happen so that's what keeps you glued in as the story plays out and then the hero or the heroine emerges and and the good guys find a way and and now through the the leadership of the of the hero or the heroine and, and all those gathering together now things start to turn and then finally by the end the tension is resolved the problem is fixed everybody is gee whiz and hallelujah and lives happily ever after unless they're planning a sequel and if they're planning a sequel they leave a little bit of tension unresolved a little bit of the crisis still sort of dangling out over here or right at the very end they introduce something else that you didn't see coming right but that's what gets you to come back and spend 50 bucks again for part two when it comes out or gets you rolling right into the next season the next episode whatever it is on netflix every storyline follows the same kind of deal it engages us and that's why we watch and engage acts 12 has got all that going on Acts 12 has got all that going on. We just left the scene in Antioch in Acts chapter 11 where things just couldn't be better, right? We've got the first Christians. We've got growth. We've got all these great things that God is doing. Then the scene shifts back to Jerusalem. It shifts back to Jerusalem and we find this leader named Herod that wanted to do away with the church, wanted to do away with Christians, wanted to make life difficult. He's persecuting. He even has one of the leaders uh, killed. Another one of the leaders is imprisoned. God's people are hiding out somewhere, praying, but guess what? By the end, Herod dies with worms. The guy who was in prison is set free, and the gospel is flourishing and advancing once again. And all of that happens in Acts chapter 12. Luke includes this little scene of what's going on for a couple reasons. One, he's making sure everybody knows that although the, the scene is sort of shifting to Antioch, and the church at Antioch is going to be front and center with what God is going to do to fulfill his promise to get the gospel to all nations. The power of God is still present and the power of God is still very much at work in Jerusalem. 
There is still work to be done and there is still work that God is doing back in and amongst the church in Jerusalem. So, so Luke's making sure that his readers are going to know that. But also, Acts chapter 12 almost serves as a little bit of a summary sort of ties everything together everything that we've experienced in our journey to acts up to this point acts chapter 12 sort of serves as this bookmark this summary especially especially the last couple of verses because they tie together what's happened up to this point and they set the stage for what is to come at the centerpiece of acts chapter 12 though at the centerpiece of acts chapter 12 is the power of god it is this undeniable truth that God is almighty in the midst of and even in spite of any human power or any circumstance God is almighty he's powerful he's powerful he's more powerful than any human power he's more powerful than any human circumstance and so what we see in acts 12 is both encouraging to the church then it's encouraging to us as the church now it was relevant to what god would do in acts 13 and beyond it's relevant to what god wants to do in us and through us now in 2022 and so we're going to walk through this text that uh john paul hill who's my new testament professor at southern is one of the world's leading scholars on acts in speaking of this wild narrative that we go through in Acts chapter 12, he says the whole story is told in one of the most delightful and engaging narratives in all of Acts. That's why we're gonna read it all, all the way, verse one to verse 25. I want you to see this thing play out and then we're gonna walk through it in what really amounts to four segments that reveal to us four truths about the power of God and lead us to a critical question to ask ourselves as we seek to live out these truths in our lives. So Acts 12, verse 1 to 25, we're going to go ahead and read the whole thing and then we'll come back and walk through this wild story of God's power. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. He executed James, John's brother, with the sword When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too during the festival of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in prison, assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but for the church, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, striking Peter on the side. He woke him up and said, Quick, get up. The chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed, the angel told him. Put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed. He did not know that what the angel did was really happening, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp, from all that Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who's called Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer She recognized Peter's voice. Because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. Are y'all picking up on some of the humorous stuff in here? If you haven't yet, we're gonna talk about it, okay? You're gonna know it's there, because it's funny. You're out of your mind, they said. She kept insisting that it was true, and they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed motioning to them with his hand to be silent he described to them how the lord had brought him out of the prison tell these things to james and the brothers he said he left and went to another place at daylight there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of peter after herod had searched and did not find him he interrogated the guards ordered their execution then herod went down from judea to caesarea and stayed there herod had been very angry at the people of tyre and sidon Together they presented themselves before him after winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On the appointed day, dressed in royal robes, seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of a god and not of a man. 
At once, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God spread and multiplied. After they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, taking along John, who was called Mark. Wild story. Four segments, four truths, four questions to ask. Listen fast and write fast. Y'all hear what I'm saying? All right. First truth, God is almighty. God is almighty, but his people still experience persecution. God is almighty, but his people still experience persecution. Herod was born in about 10 BC, known as King Herod Agrippa um, the first, the Agrippa the second, his son would take over his leadership when he passed away in 44 AD. That King Agrippa is the one that Paul would stand before of towards the end of Acts, as we'll get into that in the fall. He was uh, the grandson of Herod the Great, who was responsible for the slaughter of all the babies in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. Um, Agrippa's own father was assassinated by his grandfather, Herod the Great, when Agrippa was three. He moved with his mom to Rome and grew up in a close proximity, uh, both relationally and geographically, where they lived to uh, the imperial family. Uh, he lived largely a loose life, racked up a ton of debt, was on the run from uh, the creditors that wanted to, to get him to pay back what he owed them, wound up spending a little bit of time in jail, but he was released and actually given kingship uh, by one of the Roman emperors that he'd gotten in good with, a guy named Caligula, gave him kingship over a small province and eventually restored to him, to his kingship, all that Herod the Great had overseen and led. And he led that up until he died and again passed it on to his son who was King Agrippa II who then led and then Paul would stand before him uh, a little bit later on now Herod's treatment of the Jewish Christians was very politically motivated this was all about political gain uh, he knew how to sort of play the game as, uh, as being well acquainted with the Roman Empire and sort of what made them happy, he knew how to kind of walk the walk and talk the talk amongst the Romans. And he knew that Rome was very happy when the Jews were happy. Okay, And as long as the Jews were happy, then Rome was happy. And one of the things that was just a needle in the side of the Jews in Jerusalem was this little movement of people claiming that Jesus is Lord, that he's the Messiah, that he's resurrected from the grave, that he's conquered sin, he's conquered death, and God's offering salvation to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone. It drove these people crazy. And so Herod, as a way to sort of score some points with those that he's trying to lead and keep you know, political gain with, he then finds out where the church is, goes and has a bunch of believers arrested, and then takes James, one of the leaders, one of Jesus' inner circle, the brother of John, uh, you know, half of the sons of thunder, so to speak, and he has him beheaded. And while he was at it, he nabbed Peter, but he couldn't get Peter through trial and to execution in time before all the festivities of Passover kicked in. And because Herod was trying to sort of save face amongst the Jews, he participated in those. He, he admired them for those. He respected uh, their participation. And so part of that meant there could be no trial and there could be no execution until Passover was ended. So he threw Peter into prison. And that's where we are. You have this leader who is actively persecuting the church, persecuting believers. And it begs the question then, just as it begs the question now, why does God allow suffering, persecution, and even the death of his people, even some of his choicest servants, like James or Peter now being imprisoned once again? Why does that happen? Why is it happening in Acts 12? Why does it happen now? Why are so many of our brothers and sisters not gathering in freedom like we are in a large space like we are today? Why are they, if they're able to gather at all, gathered in small groups, dark basements, gathered in secrecy, barely even having access to God's word because of the persecution that they are up against on a day-to-day -day basis in their lives? Why does God allow it? Here's a couple things that we have to remember from Acts 12 and that, we, that apply to where we are now. Is we have to remember that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that does not function the way that God intended, the way that God created things to function. And you don't have to be a Jesus person or a Bible person to know that fundamentally something has gone wrong. So, something has gone wrong. Something's not right. We feel it in our own souls. 
We feel it and experience it when we just see what's going on in our world. Something has gone wrong. Something is not right. We live in a fallen world. And here's, here's why that's important to remember. We often underestimate the depth of depravity of the human heart. Especially a human heart that's unredeemed, unregenerate, that does not have the Holy Spirit. We underestimate the depth of depravity in our own lives, right? So the scripture says clearly that the heart is deceptive, that it is wicked above all things, which means songs and poems and speeches that say, follow your heart. You say no and run the other direction, right? Because often our hearts are deceptive and wicked because we're depraved we are broken we are a fallen people living in a fallen world and that is especially true for those that do not have the guidance the teaching the conviction of the presence of the holy spirit living inside of them through their relationship with jesus we underestimate the depth of depravity of the human heart because we live in a fallen world we also recognize this that we're in a spiritual battle there is an ongoing battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And the enemy is real. The enemy is real. Now, I want you to understand something else about the enemy. He's defeated. The war has already been won. Jesus has won the victory through his life, his death, his resurrection. Okay? The battle's the, the, the war has been won, but there is still a battle that rages on. Do you know why? Because Satan's a pathetic loser. He, he's not good with losing. He's not good with continuing to lose as the gospel continues to advance. And so you know what he does? He does everything he possibly can do to discredit what God is doing, to create division amongst the body of Christ, to get us focused on everything except the reason why that we're here. He does everything he can do to discourage leaders, even if it means that he uses tyrannical leaders even if it means that he uses intense persecution and suffering, even if it means the death of some of God's choicest servants, he will spare no end to try to stop the advance of the gospel so that lost people who have no access to the gospel remain lost people with no access to the gospel. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. Now, here's the good news. God's sovereign over all of that. N none of that takes away from God's power. None of that takes away from God's sovereignty. But God is ruling and reigning sovereignly over all of that. A fallen world and this battle that rages on between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. He is, he is working in and through all of it. That's why, that's why often suffering and persecution does not stop the gospel. It serves to fuel the advance of the gospel as we've already seen in Acts. Look at how the gospel exploded following Stephen's martyrdom in Acts chapter 7. To Samaria and Ethiopia and eunuch, all the way up to Caesarea and all the way up to Antioch, the gospel continues to go with largely unnamed evangelist missionaries. That's the power of God, leveraging persecution for the advance of the gospel. He also is able to leverage and use times of persecution and suffering in the believer's life to fashion us and form us more into the image of Jesus. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who we're going to see show up in this narrative in just a little bit, he wrote in the first chapter of his letter to the church to count it all joy when what? Everything's gee whiz and hallelujah? No, when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because God uses the testing of your faith. He uses those trials. He uses seasons of suffering. He even uses persecution to make his people look more like his son. But God is also able to rule over even the tyrannical plans of worldly leaders like Herod. The psalmist wrote about this in Psalm 2. Why do the nations plot in vain why, the, why do the nations, why do these rulers plan rage against God's people? And the psalmist says in Psalm 2 verse 4 that God looks at their plans to bottle him up, to stop his people, to stop his mission. God looks at their plans, literally is what the psalmist says, and laughs. So sovereign, so powerful over all of it, God looks 
at these tyrannical plans to bottle him up and stop his people and he laughs why we don't endure suffering and persecution for a victory that still has to be gained we are able to endure suffering and persecution from a victory that's already been won and it changes everything here's the question how's God calling you to endure How's God calling you to endure in your life? Maybe even you could ask it this way. How's God calling you to endure alongside of or maybe even on behalf of somebody else? Perhaps God's calling you to endure in prayer for some of our workers, our partners all around the world, experiencing all levels of what we're talking about right now while we also ask God to give us strength to endure in our lives here and now in Nashville how is God calling you to endure secondly we see God demonstrates his power as his people pray God demonstrates his power as his people pray so Herod apparently got word of Peter's ability to escape from jail so he double triple quadruple made sure that it wasn't going to happen again four sets four guards he even chained two guards to peter in the cell where he is yet where we find peter verse five and then following peter is at perfect peace so much so he's fast asleep it it is literally the night that he is going to die because at the moment the passover is over the execution's happening i mean the trial's happening and the execution is taking place peter knows it the church knows it everybody knows it. that's exactly what's going to happen yet peter is in this prison cell chained up to these guards all kinds of guys watching all through the night 24 7 around the clock perfect peace he's asleep what's the church doing well the church is praying the scripture says in verse 5 the church is praying fervently for him that word fervently is an athletic term the original language it communicates the idea of straining or straining forward and you can understand that if you're a runner a cyclist or walker any kind of thing like that you can understand you're doing a race you're you're doing your thing and and you're coming down that home stretch and you can see the finish line and you're so ready to get there and you start straining forward even to the point that maybe you start leaning out a little bit as you're running you even put your head down when you get to the finish you don't even have to be the guy or gal that's going to win the race you still instinctively put your head and strain out why because you were so eager to cover that last little bit of that race you're so eager to get to that finish line you're straining forward and so Luke's telling us that the church is straining in prayer. Why? Because it's the 11th hour. It's the 11th hour. They're within minutes of their bold, vocal leader potentially being executed when they've already seen one of their other leaders executed. It's in the 11th hour, and they are straining forward in prayer, which, which really, if you think about it, ought to be our posture in prayer all the time, not just at the 11th hour. Because we live in a battle, the battle is continuing to rage on, and the scripture says that the enemy is a roaming lion looking for any opportunity that he might pounce on God's people, that he might get into God's church, that he might disrupt and discourage and create all kinds of havoc in our lives. At any moment, we are susceptible to his attacks. So why would we not take on a posture of straining forward in prayer not just when we get to the 11th hour but all the hours and especially in the 11th hour so peter is asleep in the jail cell chained up to the guards the church is gathered over at john mark's mom's house which much must have been a pretty good sized place because they're all there and they are praying now what happens next has got some humor to it all right you got to go with me this is not just preacher humor stuff i'm telling you that's why paul hill said this is such a grand wonderful narrative because this stuff sort of makes its way in there angel of the lord comes to peter's cell verse seven y'all know what happens in the bible when angels show up what accompanies angels light bright light and lots of it backside of nowhere group of shepherds bethlehem 
Sky lights up with angels. They fear a big fear. They're terrified. Why? Because the light was so bright. It just, what in the world's going on, right? Saul, on his way to Damascus, persecuting Christians. Jesus comes to him with what? Light, lots of light. What happens? Knocks him on the ground, blinds him for several days. Angel of the Lord shows up in the pitch black, dark prison cell of Peter. All the light, all the glory, all of it. What's Peter doing? just snoozing away just snoozing away so what does the scripture say the angel has to do the angel has to strike him on the side he literally hit him the angel had to hit peter to wake him up no this is not a teenager or a college student on summer vacation it's peter in a jail cell and now here's the angel poking him in the side to get him up Peter's sort of groggy and what in the world's going on? The scripture says Peter didn't know. Peter's walking out of the place and he still wasn't sure. Is this really happening or am I having a dream? Like what's going on right now? He didn't know. Peter's trying to come to. So then the angel says to him, get up, quick. What are you doing? I'm here to get you out of jail. You can't ease your way into a jailbreak, pal. You gotta go, right? The time is now. Get up. Then he says what? Get dressed. Like Peter didn't know what to do. He stood up. He said, oh, what do I do now? Get dressed. Then he says, put your shoes on peter time up and he says here's your jacket get your cloak you know it's like he's a parent getting a kid out the door in the morning you know don't forget this don't forget that get this get that i mean peter's clueless as to what's going on angel walks him right out of the gate they even get to the gate and the door just opens just like you know get the parking garage and that little lever thing it just it just goes up and you and you drive out all of that happened they get all the way out of the jail they get out of the gate he takes him up one street and then boom the angel's gone it's like peter came to him and went, oh my word now i know what just happened the lord just delivered me now why did luke include all those little details even some of that funny kind of humorous stuff why did he include all of that why is, this, why is this whole interaction in here? Luke is making absolutely sure that we know from start to finish, 100%, the Lord delivered Peter. Peter was not in there coming up with some great conniving plan. All right? Peter didn't get out because of his oratory skills. He didn't get out because he's a schemer. He didn't use any ninja warrior moves, right? He didn't, none of that happened. The Lord did this start to finish it is a mirror of our salvation we are not saved rescued delivered from our sin and into eternal life by doing good works or by meeting god halfway or coming up with a plan or talking our way into or out of anything we are saved 100 percent start to finish by the finished work of jesus christ on the cross and in his resurrection it's by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, start to finish. The only thing we contributed to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. And the grace of God, out of his love for you and his love for me, sent his son to live the life we could not live, die the death that we deserve to die, to be resurrected to new eternal life, holding the keys over sin, death, and hell, and offering that victory to us. Grace alone, faith alone, in him alone. God's deliverance of Peter is a mirror of his deliverance of us. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's a picture of what he can do for you today. You walked in here in the cell of sin and death, you can walk out of here set free by the grace of God. Now, Peter comes to his senses, and it is interesting to me what he first thought. The first thing he thought to do was to find the prayer meeting. The first thing he thought to do was to find the prayer meeting. Put the dots together here. Peter just experienced this miraculous deliverance of God and his first thought was, who was praying? Peter just experienced God moving in a powerful and miraculous way in his life, delivering him from what would be, we would all say, the worst of human circumstances. And his first thought is, who was praying? Where is the prayer meeting? Where are the people who were praying for this very thing 
to happen. Oh, how I long for people to come to faith in Jesus and our community and want to know who is praying for me. For marriages and families to be restored and reconciled and brought back together. For them to show up here going, who is praying? For people to be delivered from addictions and brokenness and come to your house, come to this building, come to one of these worship gatherings and say, I just need to know who was praying. And may we be the church that is always praying, believing the power of God. Peter gets to the prayer meeting. He's knocking at the door. Little servant, Rhoda, it's her job. She's doing her job. Comes to the door. You got to check, see who's there. It's, oh my goodness, it's Peter, the guy they're praying for in there. She runs in the house. He's here. You, the guy you pray, he's out there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Peter, who just got out of jail, is standing on the street. Hello, you know. <laughs> Can somebody come do something about this whole situation? Because this might not go well, right? What do the people who are praying say to her? You're out of your mind. This strikes me. God is not even limited by our small prayers. They weren't even praying right. They weren't even praying like really believing God can do what we're even praying so that when he did it, they still didn't believe it. God's not even limited by our prayers. He works far beyond even what we're asking of him. They say, you're out of your mind. She keeps convincing. Peter's knocking. No, really, he's out there. Knock, knock, knock. Come and see. And they say this. They said, well, maybe it's his angel. They, they were more ready to believe that he had died and his angel was there than they were to believe that God had delivered him from all of it in the first place. Finally, they go out and see him. And of course, they're amazed. And apparently created quite the commotion because Peter then has to wave his hand to get him to calm down. I mean, they're just, ah, he's here. Can't believe it. And Rhoda's like, I told y'all. Peter settles them down. And I love this in verse 17. Peter told them the story of what happened and he said, the Lord delivered me. The Lord did this. The Lord got me out. In other words, this wasn't Peter's fishing story. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about? You go fishing, you catch the fish in the boat. It's this big. You figure out how to take the picture for social media, which means you hold the fish out. It makes it bigger. Do you know that? You hold the fish out from you. It makes the fish bigger. But by the time you get home, the fish is how big? Oh, heaven is world class, right? We set a record today, right? It's, it's that big. Verse 17, Peter says, the Lord delivered me. Peter did not try to spin this and say, hey, I believed and I had faith and I was praying and I was doing this and I busted these guys and nunchuck and da 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 da, -da and I stole his weapon and got out and here we are. The Lord delivered me, y'all. He says, go back and tell James and all the brothers this will encourage them to know that God is still moving in power here in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, then Peter skipped town. And, side note, that's about the last we hear of Peter in the book of Acts. We'll see him one more time in Acts 15. And that's about the end. James steps in. James, this is the half-brother of Jesus, who did not believe that Jesus was God until after the resurrection, which makes perfect sense. But James now steps to leadership in the Jerusalem church and will be the voice and will be a leading voice, especially in Acts 15, in a major, major decision that had to go down. We'll see that in the fall. So James steps in. Peter sort of fades to the background. What does all this teach us about prayer? Prayer is an invitation to depend upon God completely trusting that his power is any is greater than any human in any circumstance prayer is an invitation to depend completely on the Lord trusting that his power his power is greater than any person his power is greater than any circumstance it's an invitation to pray that 11th hour prayer all the time. That's our posture in prayer because God seems to uniquely move when God's people pray. It's not always a one-to-one -one and it's not even always the way that we pray. Remember, this worked out to the positive. But God seems to uniquely move. Look at all the ways that he's moved in Acts. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. People are saved and transformed. Miraculous things take place. Visions are seen. 
Unbelievable stuff's happening when people pray. How's God calling you? How's God calling us to pray? To strain in prayer, praying dependently, trusting that God's power is greater than any human power and certainly greater than any circumstance. Third thing, third truth is that God's glory cannot be robbed or mocked. God's, God's glory cannot be robbed or mocked. Understandably so, the whole jailbreak thing happens. Verse 19, Herod's upset about it. He goes and finds the guards. What in the world happened? How did you let this happen? You, it, it, again, we had all of you out. What did y'all do? Obviously, he wasn't happy by the response. Didn't really matter what they said. Their fate was already sealed. He had them all of them executed. Now, at some point previously or in the same time frame, uh, he had grown angry with these people, the, these groups from Tyre and Sidon. Don't know exactly what all the circumstances were, but he's angry as a, as a result of that. He cut off their food supply. So the people there are obviously upset about that. They're hungry. They've got a famine going on, national crisis. They're trying to do something about it. And so they're coming, trying to get an in with Herod. And somehow they had a connection to his chief of staff who had maybe the best chief of staff name of all time, Blastus. I mean, you go to bouncer, gatekeeper, chief of staff school, you're asking for that to be your alias because it describes not just your name, it's also what you do, right? You're the wrong person coming up here, blast us, you know, like you got this whole you know, deal that goes with it. It's pretty amazing. So they come to this guy, they say, hey, can we get a hearing before Herod? He says, sure, let me see if I can set it up. So they set up the thing and, and all the people are there, they're in, they're in Herod's court, he's gonna go sit on the throne and he walks in and he says he's got on all the royal robes, he's got all the paraphernalia, it's all there. The scripture doesn't tell us this, but Josephus, Jewish historian, tells us this, that very likely what Herod had as a part of his royal robes and all the regalia and all the paraphernalia and everything else, part of what he had was silver plated or it was actually maybe silver itself, not even covered in silver, it's actual silver. And the reason why was because he had picked up this whole angel and light trick and he wanted the same thing to happen when he walked in a room. So kind of like there's all these lights that are, that are bearing down on the stage right now. Just imagine if I walked out here in, in a silver suit, not silver the color, I mean like literally silver, like well-polished, high shine silver. And I walked out here, you would all be kind of doing that number right there, right? Well, Herod wanted people to do that. Why? Because he was trying to manufacture his own glory. So that when he walked in a room, people had to revere him and they had to exalt him and they had to extol him. Oh, Herod, you're so great. Herod, you're so wonderful. Oh, Herod, you're like a God. It's what he wanted. He walks in the room, that gathering of people there, whether it was to flatter him because of what they were there to try to get for him or it's because they really thought it, we don't know. But they began to say to him, he's like a God, he's like a God. And Herod's going, that's exactly right. Y'all bring it on. Y'all bring it. Let me turn a little bit this way so the light shines a little bit more. Y'all see all that? You know, He is eating up the exact opposite of what happened when Peter walked into Cornelius' house and Cornelius fell down on his face and began to worship Peter. And Peter said, what in the world are you doing? Get up, I'm a man just like you are. Herod's going, nah. Y'all, bring it on. Bring it on. And even though he would not stop the people from giving him glory, God stopped it. All of a sudden, Herod gets this terrible pain in his stomach, and five days later, he's dead of what? Tapeworms. God didn't need an army. He doesn't need some crazy mystical thing to happen. He didn't need some laser beam. A tapeworm took down this seemingly powerful man in all his regalia. It's a reminder to us that we must hold power, influence, wealth, all those things very, very, very carefully because none of it's ours. And the minute we make those things about us, God will have his way. Because he won't share his glory with another. I'm not him. You're not him. And when we try to make that stuff about us, he's not having it. He's not having it. It's what happened here 
with Herod. To seek glory for ourselves is literally declaring war against God. It's a glory war. God, you can't be on the throne. You can't be the one that my life is all about. I've got to be on the throne, and my life needs to be about me. What I want, and a lot of times we don't necessarily say it that way, but deep down in our hearts, we're glory thieves. Constantly in this battle, our pride, our selfishness is constantly in this battle, wanting to be in charge, wanting to call the shots, wanting to be in control, wanting to make all these things in all of our lives about us. But God will not be mocked. Herod learned it. Pharaoh learned it too. Nebuchadnezzar learned it. All those guys that were calling on Baal on the top of Mount Carmel when Elijah called the fire of God down, they learned it. Saul, when God tore the kingdom away from him and gave it to David, Saul learned it. When Jesus walked out of that grave alive, the enemy learned it. God's glory cannot be stopped, will not be mocked, will not be robbed because there's no one else like him. No one else is worthy of glory because no one else has his power. He's alone, category all by himself. Here's the question How's God calling us to repent of being glory thieves? How, how are we trying to take God's glory and take God's position on his throne in our lives and make life about us? And how do we need to repent and turn from that? And then how do we need to pray for those who are in leadership? Pray for those who are in leadership to steward the influence, the power, the authority they've been given for God's glory. Because ultimately, God is the author and the giver of all of it. He's sovereign over all of it. Now, a lot of times it's real easy for us to pray for leaders to lead for the glory of God while missing all the ways that we're robbing God of his glory in our own lives, right? So that's, it's a purposeful order. Lord, show me where I'm robbing you of glory in my own life while I also pray for those that have leadership and authority over me to leverage all of that for your glory. Last thing, verse 24. I mean, this wild story. And where does it end? It starts with two of the main guys one of them executed one of them jail church hiding out in john mark's mom's house praying but hiding out not knowing what's going to happen next expecting peter to be executed herod carrying on his tyrannical rule all for his glory and where does it end verse 24 the word of god spread and multiplied because God is almighty and Jesus is alive, the gospel cannot be stopped. Because God is almighty and Jesus is alive, the gospel cannot be stopped. These verses almost serve as that sort of tie together overview of everything we've experienced up to this point in Acts and all the ways that God has flexed his power. We've seen very clearly up to this point in Acts that persecution has not stopped and is no match for the advance of the gospel. Even the worst forms of persecution, God has leveraged and used it for the advance of the gospel. It hasn't stopped the gospel. We've seen how unbelieving leaders and tyrants cannot stop the advance of the gospel. We've seen how even difficult circumstances for God's people have not stopped the advance of of the gospel this movement remember back in acts 1 we started with 11 average ordinary ragtag guys that jesus called together as his disciples that were freaked out at the crucifixion didn't know what to do in the resurrection still had some doubts about what all was going on and how this was going to work out from that 11 it goes to 120 that are praying the holy spirit comes peter preaches thousands are saved another group of thousands are saved within days and on from there day by day the lord adding to their number from jerusalem then on to samaria then on to caesarea then in the midst of that ethiopian unit comes to christ and all the way up to antioch how does that happen because god is almighty and he is sovereign sovereign 
He's ruling and reigning. His mission is advancing persecution, tyrannical leaders, difficult circumstances. None of it will stop the advance of his mission. You know why? Because Jesus is alive. Defeated sin, defeated death, hell has no power over the people of God in the advance of the gospel because Jesus is alive. So the question is not, is God on mission to make himself known in all the earth? That's not the question. The question is, are we joining him? Are we joining him on mission? Are we joining him in what he's doing? This summer is going to create and present to you and your family all kinds of new and cool opportunities to reach your neighbors and friends and family members with the gospel gathering together having neighborhood barbecues getting together at your home vacationing together whatever it might be all kinds of opportunities are coming maybe this is the time for you and your family to re-up your commitment to to the one that God's put on your heart to pray for and invest in and seek to share the gospel with and aim for that this summer believe the power of God and the life of that person that he's put on your heart that he's placed you in proximity with that he's burdened you to pray for and seek to share the gospel with Maybe just maybe in the coming weeks and months, God's going to call you and give you the opportunity to go on a mission team, to be a part of one of our mission engagements. Right now, our Kenya team, our Kenya team, in a general summary, have seen people come to faith in Christ in villages that previously had little to no gospel witness. And now, in those villages, multiple churches have been planted. That happened this week. People who had not heard, heard, responded, Leaders emerged and a church was planted this week. Why? Because God is sovereign. He's all powerful. He's on mission. Jesus is alive and we get to listen, join in it. We get to join in and be a part of what God is doing to make his glory known in all the earth. What a privilege. Are you kidding me? Knowing that the battle, the victory is already ours in Christ. What a joy, what a privilege. He's almighty over persecution. He shows up in power when his people pray. He will not allow his power to be robbed, stolen, or mocked. And he empowers his people to join him on mission. Why? Because nothing can stop the advance of the gospel. And that's what we're a part of. I mentioned this earlier, but as we close, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to be encouraged by the way the power of God showed up in Peter's life and delivered him from this jail that he found himself in. And I want you to know today beyond a shadow of a doubt that the same power of God can rescue you from the jail of sin and death. You walked in here bound up with guilt and shame wondering about what is on the other side of this life you can leave here forgiven set free and assured that you will live forever and it won't be because of anything you've done it's be because of what jesus has already done on your behalf and you receiving that gift today if you're ready to take that step our encouragers are going to be around the room you step out and grab one of them say hey i need to give my life to christ today we'd love nothing more than to pray with you and help you take that step secondly for all of you that are that, that are christians that are followers of jesus let's make this a matter of prayer Let's make this a time that we pray and seek the Lord and say, God, help me to endure. In your power, help me to endure. Whatever might be going on, help me to endure. God, call me. Help me to pray. To pray, straining in prayer, believing that you can move in power. And Lord, move even beyond what I'm praying. If I'm not praying it right, then you just go ahead and raise the level and you move beyond it. Let's ask God to help us not be glory thieves. Make life about us, but help us to live life all about him and his power and his glory and then let's ask god to give us power to join with him in his mission make the gospel known all over this city and in all nations i'm going to pray we're going to have a time of invitation and response father thank you for what you are doing right now in our faith family thank you for what you're doing in people's lives thank you for acts what a joy it has been to walk through this what a powerful sort of bookmark we land here acts 12 God, I pray for those in this space right now that don't know you as Savior and Lord, that today would be their day of salvation. Today would be the day they say yes to you and experience the freedom and the deliverance that's available to them in you through your son Jesus and his finished work on our behalf. God, for those of us that know you, 
Help us right now to give our lives fully trusting and believing that you are almighty. Believing your power and relying on your power to help us endure in the midst of suffering and persecution. Calling on your power in prayer. Not robbing you of your power, but surrendering to you, submitted to you while we join with you in mission, empowered by your spirit to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. God, you are worthy. We want to give our lives to you. We want to be on mission with you. We want to be used by you and for you. So in this time of response, Lord, lead us in that way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship and respond as you feel led. Our encouragers will be around the room. Rumors of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior Holiness with human hands A treasure for the traitor No ear has heard, no eye has seen The image of the Father Until heaven came to live with me A rescue like no other You are worthy You are worthy of your name You are worthy Yes, you are
Can we just put our hands together and praise to the Lord? He's worthy. He's the only one who is worthy. If you would, take a moment and sit down. I want to share a couple things with you, and we've got a special presentation to make this morning that will be encouraging for all of us as we welcome some new members. But let me say a couple things. Uh, first, grateful for Jonathan and Emily Martin being here to lead worship this morning for us again. Thank you guys for being here. Great friends of our church, longtime friends of our church. And I'd be praying for them. They're getting ready to set out on a summer of, of camp ministry that's extensive and massive and you guys are going to do great things they serve in that way every year their whole family invests in that so be praying for the martins and i don't know are we going to see y'all some more this summer oh my goodness well y'all need to talk about it <laughs> we yeah, yeah i don't know we might we might hopefully we will we'll figure it out anyway but anyway y'all be praying for them we're grateful for the martins and their ministry uh with us here at forest hills um those of you that are new to Forest Hills, we'd love to connect with you after the service. Come see us in the Welcome Center. Kenneth Bonnet and some of our other team will be there. We've got a gift we'd love to give you. Just say welcome and hello, and we'd love to help you get connected here uh, at Forest Hills. As you know, VBS, two weeks away. Hard to believe you're in our kids' area. You saw some things already happening this morning, as well as other places throughout the building. You'll see more the next couple weeks. One of the biggest things that we do all year. So grateful for all of you that are serving. Get your kids signed up. If you haven't done it yet, get them signed up. Invite your friends. Get them signed up get grandkids all of them get them signed up make life a whole lot easier if you'll pre-register those before you get here on monday uh, of vbs week it'll be a great time and then last but not least remember next week and this has minimal impact for you but just so you know what's going on in our church is uh, we're starting our new schedule next week with our 8 15 traditional service all of our sunday school classes meeting at 9 30 and then this service stays right here this time 11 o'clock no change for you uh coming in here but next sunday i do want you to be here i know it's memorial day weekend and all that good stuff but we're building the whole service around community union around the lord's supper i'm going to preach on that why do we do this why is it important uh what does it mean what's the significance that we're gonna have a great time of worship and reflection as we engage in that time of worship together so be here next sunday kenneth bonnet our connections minister you come and lead us we got some new members uh to welcome this morning which is always a fun and good thing so that is a real good thing. So uh, last weekend, and you'll remember at the end of the service, uh, you guys voted to affirm 16 new members to come and join us at Forest Hills. And so we're excited this morning to be able to welcome them. You'll notice in your bulletin that you have an insert uh, because they're not all in this service, but there are some in this service. But the insert has um, all of the folks that joined. So uh, take a look at that. When you see them around the campus here, um, be, be, be welcoming. Thank them for joining us and, and just be extend a warm hand there. So um, this morning, the, the folks that uh, are coming, Pastor Jeff's going to come up here, um, and uh, you guys join him up here, all of you, you guys too, yep. Um, embarrass them and bring them in front of everybody. Uh, so this morning, in, in this particular service, uh, we've got uh, uh, Ryan Putback. You guys may have never seen Ryan before, but if you turn around a lot of times, he's actually sitting at the board back there. So he's he's always serving here. We've got Grayson McKellen, who actually came uh, and was baptized a few weeks ago, and so that was exciting to be able to do that. Um, and then we've got Rick and Rebecca uh, Palmas uh, right here. Uh, well, where's, oh, right here. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, uh, there's, there's some in between you there. So um, glad to have uh, them joining us this morning. And so um, as has our, been our practice, uh, whenever we welcome new members, we always recite um, our church covenant. Um, and we do that uh, because one, they're covenanting with us, but we're also covenanting with them. Um, and so we want to reflect that. And so we wanna, we wanna recite that together. So you see the words on the screen there. Um, and it said, just repeat with me, um, as members of Forest Hills Baptist Church, we will support the church's statement of faith and place ourselves under the authority of Scripture as the final arbiter on all matters. We will support the vision and mission of Forest Hills Baptist Church with our time, finances, and other resources. We will I, encourage each other, spurring one another on in love and good deeds, meeting together consistently. We will, with humility and faithfulness, pray for one another regularly and encourage the leadership of the church. When necessary, we will humbly and gently confront one another 
receiving correction in accordance with the New Testament understanding of church discipline and restoration. And so um, these folks are going to be out in the fellowship hall with Pastor Jeff. He's going to lead them out there. And when you guys leave, please stop by and welcome them and just give them a handshake or a hug or whatever happens to be the best way to do that. Now, if you're looking at these folks up here and saying, uh, I've, I've been here for a while and I've never become a member, uh, good. I'm glad you're saying that. Um, this Actually, today, if you've got lunch plans, cancel your lunch plans because at 12 o'clock in C100 over right off of the atrium, we're having a luncheon where we're going to share with you, which is the first step um, of becoming a church member. So we're going to share with you in our Explore First Baptist, or Forest Hills, and so, uh, so excited you to be able to join us there. So come on, join us. We've got plenty of food, so we'd love to have you. Let me pray, and then we will be um, dismissed. Father God, we are so grateful that, God, you bless us in so many ways. God, you bless this church in amazing ways, and we've, you blessed us by bringing these new members to join us, and so we're thankful for them today. We're thankful that um, we get to celebrate with them and we just welcome them in today. Father, we just pray that as uh, we go out from this place, that we would be um, the type of uh, disciples that we see in the book of Acts, that we're just so excited about who you were and what you had done that we just have to tell everybody about it. And Father, we just pray that as we go out today, that you would just uh, be a blessing in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.